afternoon. I'm going to get things started here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Laura Heisler. I'm Director of Programming at the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And I am pleased to bring you our third installment in the new Entrepreneur On series. As you know, if you've been to the other events, our goal in this series is to tackle core concepts in a sequential manner that allow us, that involved in, in start, uh, starting a new venture, that allow us to look in depth at each topic, both from sort of a national perspective, big picture perspective, and then take a deeper dive with our panelists into sort of local perspectives depending on different technologies. So we really hope to bring you a full spectrum, 360 degree view of each topic. We've carefully chosen the sessions to build on one another. Another. So um, going forward for the rest of this semester, you can see what we have ahead of us. Looking backward, last week we talked about intellectual property, which is often at the core of, of any new startup. And the week before that, we asked the question, do you even really want to start a company? And so we're building forward. And now that we've identified, yes, we do. At least we do. At least we want to suppose that for the sake of this series. And we've identified how to protect our crown jewels. Now we want to talk about how do we bring those people together to put one foot in front of the other. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, let me give you a little bit of housekeeping, a few procedural notes about how we're going to proceed as we have at the previous sessions. This first hour will we'll focus on a keynote talk and I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. At the end of his talk there'll be some time for some Q&A and we really invite you to, to come together with your questions. We really want to ask you to use the microphone because we're taping all of these sessions. We're creating a nice digital library of each of these talks so that in case you miss one you can catch up. So it's really important to capture your questions on the tape. So if you can wait for the mic we'll We'll get to you. Following the end of the keynote, we'll bring the panel up here at about 5 o'clock. We'll have some moderated discussion, and then we'll open that up again for more Q&A as well. And then as soon as we, we wrap up the questions, we'll adjourn to a nice networking reception with food and drink in the atrium that's right behind you. And actually, the doors will magically lift up and invite you into the beautiful atrium. And we invite you to stick around and talk to the speakers in a little bit more depth. So that's, that's how we're going to proceed. We're also going to send you a survey tomorrow morning and ask for your feedback on this session as well as ideas for future sessions. So please do stay engaged with us. If you haven't already signed up to be on our email list, please do. And please do grab a name tag because this is your ticket uh, to the bar. So you'll want that. OK, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Brian Wigand. Brian is a Wisconsin native and a UW-Madison grad. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur, self-identified as a serial entrepreneur. He founded his first company called Biz Filings in 1996. He has not looked back. After the sale of his third company, Jellyfish, to Microsoft in 2007, he tried to uh, work for somebody else, but found the call of being an entrepreneur just too strong. Went back and uh, buddied up again with his uh, previous co-founder uh, co of other companies, Mark McGuire, and um, they created Alice.com. And they are working now, I believe they're working together on Hopster.com, and I'm sure we'll hear more from Brian about that. In addition to his many accomplishments as a serial entre entrepreneur, Brian is also on the board of Sonic Foundry, and we are really fortunate to have him with us today to talk to us about his philosophy around building a startup team. So with that, I'd like to bring up Brian. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. This is always fun to come and talk about you know, a little bit about myself, but hopefully to share some of the stories and some of the things um, uh, that I've learned along the way. And you know, my topic, uh, you know, I was thinking about um, the topic, and there's a lot of different topics that are part of this program. And, and uh, of all the different ones that um, we chose, I'll get into this in a little more detail. But you know, I was thinking there's a lot of different ones I could speak about. But after doing a lot of research, it turned out that this was actually a, an eye-opening experience for me as well. And in thinking about building teams, you don't, you know, when you're you're an entrepreneur and you're you're going forward and you're just operating and executing. You don't go back and think about, hmm, what the, how do we do this? And you don't, you're not really looking at it scientifically and, and reflecting on it. And you get a chance when you give a presentation to go back and, and really reflect. I learned a ton about some of the things I've done and didn't do and were successful and not successful with in building teams. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit. I'll give a little background um, with myself and just uh, spend a minute or two on just some of the successes and failures that I've had. And, uh, and then talk about, I think, you know, starting a team from literally the team from like a co-founder, uh, the initial team, or to teams that aren't even employees, teams of your, your partners, your attorneys, your um, advisors, investors, or I, I consider all part of your initial starting team. And I'll talk about culture, you know, and it's really one of the cool things and 
one of the challenging things with uh, startups is culture and trying to establish a culture and, and create something that uh, is successful with a blend of new people um, coming together in a new company. And then I'd open it up for some Q&A from there. So my background, Laura mentioned a few things. I'll just go over it real quickly. So um, I'm you know, very proud. I'm, I'm very excited. I, I um, was at UW and I took a job out east. and. I actually got fired from that job because I was trying to <laughs> push forward a new uh, a new department, and it was just this young kid out of college, and I was really excited about this company. It was a small company, and, and I was trying to create a new department and kind of start my own company within a company, and I was just pushing a little too fast, and I, I actually got let go um, because I wasn't focusing on what I was hired on. I was focusing on starting a new <laughs> entity, and that was a really eye-opening experience for me because I learned a lot about myself and what I wanted to do. And so um, I was out in New York City, and I wanted to put, uh, I, this is back in 1996, I think Amazon was just being founded, the domain name was just registered right around 95, 96, and I, I, I wanted to put all the restaurants in New York City on the internet, that was kind of my vision and, uh, at the time, and so I was going door to door, knocking on uh, uh, restaurants in New York City, I'd take the train in from Connecticut, and at lunch, just go to a restaurant, there's like 5,000 in Manhattan, and it was, you know, I think I cover 15, 20 a day, and, um, and and I was like, this is really hard work. <laughs> I thought, and because I and then I needed to incorporate my business, and I and so I, then I started to think, how can I incorporate this? I got to call an attorney. What do I need to do? And so I thought, well, there's got to be a lot of businesses starting up. And so I said, instead of going door to door, walking around uh, trying to get menus on the internet, when the internet was still a you know very scary word, um, I thought, why not actually create a business to help uh, new businesses starting up? create their, you know, form their corporation, file for an LLC or a corporation. So I created, I saw Edine was the restaurant business and I let the domain name go um, and quickly shifted uh, to Biz Filings, thankfully. And so I did this out of my basement. I raised $5,000, borrowed it for some friends. And, you know, that was kind of the start of my, you know, my life. Um, so I started Business Filings in 96. And then we sold that for about, we took on no other investment. Fortunately, the revenue and things were coming uh, very quickly. We set the site up so you could come in and fill out a form and um, uh, form your corporation very quickly. Uh, the business is still in town today. It sold for about $14 million with a $5,000 investment. It was a very nice return. And <laughs> I wish they were all that easy and fast and simple, but then I formed, I partnered with Mark McGuire, and I formed Name Protect, which was a business in helping uh, uh, brands protect their intellectual property, do trademark searching, um, and that sold for 20 some odd million. We took some venture capital on with that business, um, and then, then you know, things are just rolling, and uh, we decided to, those were both business to business businesses, B2B businesses, where I was selling to other businesses, new businesses starting up, or uh, businesses that wanted to protect their intellectual property. So Mark McGuire, my uh, co-founder, and I thought, well, let's try to create something more of a consumer brand, something where you know everyday consumers, not selling to businesses, but sell to consumers. And so we started Jellyfish, and um, that one took more than five thousand dollars, but it was only lasted eighteen months. We were having so much fun with that, and then Microsoft came along and uh, and bought that business uh, for just, I guess, I think it's fairly public, fifty million dollars. So it was you know kind of a fourteen million a 20 some million 23 million and then 50 million and then all right now i'm ready for the big one and then i formed alice and we're cruising along and that one failed <laughs> <laughs> um so it, it humbled myself and mark uh, uh a lot and you know you could uh, learn a lot from the failures you can you can uh, uh stop and say I'm more, you know maybe i'm not good at startups uh, but still having three successful businesses one failure it really, I think, helped actually improve, you know, kind of the playbook and the model that I was using. And so, picked right back up from that and formed Popster in, in 2012. And I've been with Mark McGuire, my co-founder, all the way through all these businesses. And so what we decided to do on this new one is instead of partnering, let's each start a business and we'll invest in each other's businesses. And so he started a business called Next, which is a brand new business, a mobile business. And I started Hopster, which is thankfully going extremely well, knock on wood, um, but we're not here to talk about that. Um, but that's a little bit about my background. Um, I've hired, personally hired probably, I think I was trying to total it up over 300 people um, through all those different businesses. Some businesses had more, some had less, but a lot of, a lot of team building, a lot of culture, a lot of uh, 
uh, very dramatically different types of uh, environments. And, and you know, they all have a little bit, uh, all in Madison, except for Business Finance started in, um, in New York City, and then I moved it to Madison, much better place to raise a family. Um, and so, you know, back to this topic, you know, of all the, you know, I had all those successes and sold companies and raised money and all the different things I'd be excited to talk about, like kind of I was saying at the beginning is, you know, why do I get to starting a team? But, you know, like I said, when I reflected on it, it was really actually fascinating to go back and think about, um, as I kind of said in the very beginning, about some of the things I did and didn't do. And um, I learned a ton and learned how really, arguably, it wasn't about how good I could raise capital on a new business. It wasn't about, you know, how I could, you know, sell the business or, or how I could, uh, you know, use a, use a tech team to build products or come up with ideas or, it was actually the people. It really turned out, that if you really look back at, at my successes and failures, it was really about the people. And, and that's also the re rewarding part about um, the business side and the startup side is, is uh, there's nothing better than, uh, just as a quick aside, just hit me, is what, uh, uh, you know, hiring people, when you're bringing someone into an internet startup and you hire someone from, you know, let's say it's a large corporate environment, it doesn't matter which one, American family, whatever, some large corporate environment, and they've been in their corporate environment their whole life, and they come in, they interview, and they want a, you know, like a VP position here at the internet startup, whatever one, there's just so many examples of it, and then they come in in first day, and they're just like, whoa, what am I doing? It's a whole, you know, where are the meetings? What are we, you know, it's just, it's a whole different, I love that, it's a really great feeling from hiring someone out of one of a, a large corporation coming into a, uh, uh, a startup because it's just a completely different experience process and, and it takes some time for uh, for those people to realize the freedom and the and the creativity you can have in a startup and the lot, lack of structure compared to coming from an uber ultra structured corporate environment to this and so um, that was just an aside I just uh, about building teams but so I went back and looked at and, and thought about for me why teams were successful or helping my success and failures but <laughs> When we look at it, and I have a few quotes and some data here, but, and this one's interesting, I'll just read it. Uh, what matters is not ideas, but the people who have them. Good people can fix bad ideas, but good ideas can't save bad people. And, you know, if I think about, and I've, I've counseled, I've helped a lot of entrepreneurs along the way, and it's always, I got a really good idea. You know, everyone's got, I, I really feel like ideas are a dime a dozen. It's not about ideas. We could sit down and maybe talk after, and we could <laughs> talk for 10 or 15 minutes and probably come up with four or five really good ideas. It's, it's more about the execution of those ideas and the people that can do something with those ideas. And so, and I think this quote kind of talks about that. And some more data to support that. You know, I was looking at VCs, venture capitalists, and um, you know, when they're looking at evaluating, I think is a good barometer, right, of, of uh, when they're looking at a new company to invest in and to put money in, it's always a good, good place to kind of see what, what's important and what's not. And when you look at a VC, they're really looking at team, 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 team. Again, I think the same kind of philosophy. I'm not trying to completely say idea is worthless, but I, I would say that I could take a B idea with a really good team and go a lot further than a really great idea with a bad team. And so I think venture capitalists also, when they're investing, they're really looking at that team. And so if you're starting a business, you know, everyone's, oh, I got this idea. I think it's also to make sure you put at least as much energy into the idea is, is into actually who are you going to, what's the team? Who's it going to be? How is this going to come together in terms of who's going to execute on that? And then um, uh, Peter Thiel, everyone, or not everyone, but he's a very popular, sold uh, uh, PayPal. He's uh, obviously uh, is now a venture capitalist, and he obviously believes kind of as well with his quote about people are key, it's in the foundation of the company. If you look at companies, and I was trying to get some stats, and I, you know, coming off of a, a failure and now starting a new one, I was really reflecting on myself as well and how I could improve the model. And you know, I sold three businesses in a row, not hundred million, not billion dollars. So I, I, you know, that's where I'm trying to shoot for is to kind of be better and bigger and, and not fail and continue to have successes uh, and hopefully bigger. But the it's amazing the odds, right, when you're starting a business. And I know, you know, there's some other speakers about should we start or not start, but it just kind of looking at the team and why businesses fail, I think uh, the team and the execution is a big reason, but it's amazing the stats. Nine out of 10 businesses fail. I mean, that is incredible. 
um, stats and, and odds that you're going up against if you're starting a business and to really think about that. And, and, and again, I think you know, here's another stat. So if you get venture capital, um, three out of four fail. So <laughs> if you can convince venture capitalists to invest in you, you move from a 10% to a 25% chance or a, a chance of success. And again, I, you know, and that's what I was saying is that one of the things they're looking at are team. So team's a big reason of why you're going to be successful um, versus not being successful. And so, again, and, you know, just kind of looking at that and reflecting back and, uh, you know, I, uh, talking about building a team and looking at that data and reflecting myself, it was really, it was really impactful to see how, how important that was. And, and one of the first members here of the team that you did, and I mentioned this earlier, is a co-founder or co-founders or not have a co-founder. So if you have an idea, you want to start a business and you're thinking about building your team, um, the question of a partner is always you know, one of the early decisions. And for me, I, you know, I really think it's important for me and for anyone to really recognize your strengths and your weaknesses. And if you've never started a business or you've never been in the situation, you really don't know necessarily what all your strengths or weaknesses are. And I think a good entrepreneur, someone that's gonna be successful in business, I think it's key. And if, I think one of the key, really key traits are a multidisciplinary approach. Meaning if you have a lot of skills, in, or maybe not a lot of skills, but skills in many areas, meaning you can sell, um, you can have some technical skills, you might be able to uh, know marketing, um, you, you can raise capital, you know, whatever it might be. There's a number of skills that you might need to, to start a business. But I think if you look at successful um, entrepreneurs that have been really successful, I think one of the key things is they are able to do many different things fairly well. They can have a technical conversation with you. That doesn't mean they're programming, but they can wield a technical conversation, they can sell, um, they can do a lot of different things. And so when you're thinking about starting a business, you can't necessarily do it all, and I can't do it all. And I would never, ever, 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 ever start a business without a co-founder. I, I just know it would be an immediate failure because of some of the things that the co-founders I've had in the past have helped. And generally, it's a complete opposite of you. It's uh, someone that compliments you. Now, I think optimally, it would be one, you know, again, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just sharing some thoughts, my successes. I think optimally, you could have 10 co-founders. I just think that's gonna be uh, trouble from the get-go. Um, you can have none. And I think that's also gonna be problematic because I think that you're going to need help. You can always hire, right? But it's different when you have someone that's coming in as a co-founder versus hiring someone. You can incent them with options and equity and do all, it's still different of someone that's making a sacrifice and coming in um, so I, I highly recommend co-founders, and I, I, I think, you know, one, maybe two, I, I wouldn't go more than that. Again, there's exceptions to all these situations, but for me, it's really critical to go into this idea of starting a business and starting a team with a co-founder. And if you think about it, it's a very, you know, we said nine out of 10 fail, three out of four, the venture funded. It's a very challenging, stressful ride. Um, it's, it, it, it it all seems great when you, you know, you, the, the end of it, when you can sell a business and make a ton of money or, or see a customer satisfied with something you've built or changed the world in some way, or like some of my businesses that some, they're still existing in the West side and you know, you go in and they're all different people, but then it was like a business I started or you, you're in the airport and you, you look on the, the TV at the thing and there's an ad for the company you started and you're like, wow, you know, I started that, you know, it's that proud feeling. There's those good feelings about, about starting a business, but it's very challenging. And you know, we talked about the odds. It's very, it's, you got to be able to endure that roller coaster ride of ups and downs. And one, you know, some people that have heard me talk before. <laughs> one of the things, and I, I even on my new one, Hopster, I, I feel the same kind of thing. I, I, I have this kind of the way I organize my thinking. You know, some days are good. You're you get a big client, or you make a big uh, uh, move, or you raise some money, or some good, or or something bad happens. And <laughs> a lot of days. In a startup, not everything is always good. And so it's amazing the difference between one day and the other. And I always say, and I always have this thing, is that one day I really think I'm going to be filing bankruptcy. And oh my God, what did I just do? I put all this money in there. I was going to be a huge failure. And the other day I feel like I'm going to be a billionaire. And how can you go from one day thinking you're on top of the world, you're going to make all this money, and then the next day thinking, oh, it's personal ruin, bankruptcy, personal guarantee. What am I going to do? What happened? Why did I... And if you're gonna go up and down with emotions, think about it, that's dramatic emotions. That's, and there's very few things in life where you can 
yank yourself emotionally from one perspective to another in a 24 hour period. And so I love a co-founder to be able to vent. You know, I actually spend more time with my co-founder than I did my wife for a number of years. <laughs> and, it, and so it is really a big part of your life. And so I, I really think in that, when you're thinking of a team, an initial part of the team, getting a co-founder is helpful. And, it, and there's just the personal and the professional sacrifices and, and doing it alone is just challenging. And so I like to have someone that's in the boat with me when it's sinking or when we're, we're doing really well. Um, and so that, you know, when we're thinking about team, I highly recommend when you think about team, the first team member is, is co-founder or a co-founder's couple. But, all right, so now you have a co-founder. Well, I, just real quick on that. You know, I say that. You might have an idea. You might want to start a business. It's, it's a lot more difficult than, and I talk to a lot of people, they have a business, they have an idea, they're ready to go, and all right, I, I, I just heard Brian say that I need a co-founder, and he's right because I don't know this, and I could use some help here. Well, it's, just, it's not like you go dial up a co-founder. I mean, it, you know, it's one, <laughs> one of those things that's very challenging. And so I highly recommend, you know, that you know, when you're building the, uh, uh, the, the business of the idea that you're hopefully you're, you're befriended with someone. Maybe you're more of the sales-oriented person. Hopefully you can uh, partner with someone technical. But again, it's not just something you can go find. So it's something that before you just jump right in, it, it, it's something to really spend some time and think about about that. And that's again, what the essence of this session is, is about a team and you're thinking about what's your team that you're gonna be doing. All right, so we're past co-founders. Um, now, what other members of the team? Before we're even hiring here, we're not even starting to hire people, we're just talking about team, co-founder, and I think that's not just members of our people that you hire or co-founders, I think your team of service providers and, and, and you know, it's attorneys, it's accountants, it's your board, it's advisors, it's investors potentially. And I view these as really important members of your team as well. And, um, and they should not be looked at really much different than any of the other members of the team as you start hiring. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how powerful these team members can be. Um, and they have been for me. Um, you know, like an attorney, um, you know, I talk to, like I said, when, I, when someone comes to me and says, I have an idea, I want to help, and I'd love some ideas and thoughts, and can you mentor me? Um, and they go, I have this idea, I've talked to this person, and this, and I said, do you have an attorney? Oh my God, no, I don't have an attorney. I, I don't want to start the clock and billing, and, and oh, I, I, we haven't even gotten that far yet. And, and I think you have the wrong attorney if you're already billing at this stage when you haven't even started your business. And so um, the attorney that I use, and I've used every time, is, is Paul Rich at Foley and Lardner. I think he's a great, uh, a guy that understands um, uh, startups and, and doing deals, and it's not about billing in the first few minutes or conversations or maybe even first few months or whatever with a, uh, um, a startup. That's not the way the startup legal side works. I mean, again, there are lawyers that, you know, let's go to lunch, let's hear your idea, that's 350 bucks. That's the, I guess, my view of that's the wrong attorney. Um, but um, I think that it's critical to get someone on your team that's not gonna bill you right away, but is willing to, again, you, you almost, you're almost getting them as an investor in a way, because you have to convince them that they're willing to work with you and not be billing day one, or they'll delay, bill. you know, there's a lot of creative ways you can do it. But I view that's critical member of the team early. Uh, same with accountants, you know, uh, um, <laughs> I've used the same accountant all the way through as well. Um, and board members, we could go into very good detail about how to find board members. That's all, uh, almost a whole presentation. Um, it's critical um, to get, uh, even though it's something I hate, because that's one of the reasons I love about a startup, right, is you're your own boss. Board smells like boss to me. <laughs> it, it really is. And I, as much as I dislike it, it, it does help. Um, I can even, it just pains me to say it even right now. But it is, you gotta have a board, it's over. And if you're gonna get investors, right, I mean, this, you, if you don't have some oversight, everyone has got someone to report to and answer to someone. And board is, is uh, who I report to, and, and it, it's a member of your team, it's, it's an important one. And then you can always plug in, advisor is kind of that uh, one you can just plug in at any moment. Yeah, he's an advisor, she's an advisor, they help me with it. You know, you can always get a, a group of advisors to help. And so um, that's an important one as well. And that really can depend on the business. Different businesses require different sets of advisors. And, um, and it's funny, sometimes I'll see, like I start a business, I got a 15 person board of advisors. 
I don't have anyone on the board. I haven't raised any money yet, but I've got a 15-person board of advisors. I commend that person for doing that, but I think it's not just all about one. It's about a diversity of a lot of different members of the team. And so let me give an example of why and how that can be powerful. And I have a, a philosophy, and I, again, this isn't original, but I think if you Googled this, I think there's probably you know a billion people that use this philosophy, but it's important to me, and I, I call it influence the influencers. When you're raising capital, you know, somebody might come up and say, how, well, how do you raise, you know, I've raised about $100 million of venture capital across all the different businesses. You know, how do you do that? You know, how do you convince someone to raise money? And, and I always say, you know, I, I, hopefully you can get to a stage where you don't have to ask anyone for money and the money can come in. That's very difficult to do. Um, and not every, uh, every instance it works that way. But the key thing is, is, you know, going back to one of the team members of an attorney, right? So if you get an attorney and you talk to that person and you convince him or her that uh, of your business and you know here's what I'm doing and if he or she's really excited about that and, and that person is a really um, a good uh, attorney has a tremendous influence talking to investors talking to other people and so influencing influencers is something I've used throughout my career and it's a tip that I, I highly recommend there's no art I can't write down the formula how to do it it's just go out and if you can't sell people um, that your idea, just talking to them, get them excited about it. And those people that you're selling or talking to, if they get excited about it, it's naturally going to create a buzz and an energy. And it's a magic how it works. Um, and it, it does um, allow your idea to kind of get spread around. And then you have situations like, oh, are they raising money? I wouldn't mind putting some money into that. And you haven't even met the entrepreneur yet. You know, I mean, that, that's really powerful if you can get to that. That level and a lot of it is your ability to sell and how good the idea is and um, and the ability to get the right set of influencers um, and another one of my tips that that kind of follow um, the influence the influencers always take an investment from your barber um, and it's a classic example and I've used this believe it or not it's worked um, so if you think about it, if you find a, a, a you know a stylist, a barber, uh, whatever you want to call this person, if you find one that maybe is is uh, has a ton of rich clientele, and you get this person all fired up, all they're doing all day is just cutting, washing. Oh, I about this company? It's really cool. Shooting, washing, and then the next client comes in. Oh, it's a really cool company. And the next thing you know, after a month, there's like 50, 60 people that heard about your company and are all hyped up about it. And so my rule in any business I start up, I always get my barber as an investor as step number one. I don't know if that'll work for you, um, but it's worked for me. <laughs> but it is really about the concept of influencing influencers. I've never really thought of my barber as an influencer, but it can work. All right, now, everyone like, God, he might be actually selling me something interesting. And I lost everyone at the barber thing, <laughs> didn't I? I'm sure I did, but <laughs> it's actually worked. Um, and it's also a critical source for building your team and recruiting as well, all these different um, people. And if I think back of the 300 people that I've hired, and uh, not all of them are, um, are really high level, um, there's different levels, right? From uh, customer service to you know, VPs to whatever it might be, and you're, depending on what business you have and the different people you're hiring. But I have to say, you know, I went back, and again, it's reflecting part of this uh, presentation, if, if all the, kind of senior level department head people that I've hired, you know, maybe 15, 20, 30 of them, I've never ever actually put an ad out. Or let me put it on the paper. Let me put it on Monster. Let me, uh, you know, or Ladders or whatever it might be. It hasn't come from that. It's come from this group of the team of your influencers. Now, that's not to say if I'm hiring, you know, different positions. You know, we were just hiring a customer service uh, associate the other day. We got 120 applicants by putting it on a job board. That so you can get really good results that way for certain positions, but really influential, important ones, I think it's going to come from that initial team um, of your advisors. So influencing influencers and also helping and building the team and recruiting. So now we have a co-founder and um, or more than one co-founder and we have a team of uh, advisors and you got a good looking hairdo and you move forward with your business um, and now it's about kind of and I could get into talking about hiring and who to hire. And I mean, again, there's so much in this topic. Another one, I, first of all, I was thinking when you were saying this topic, I'm like, I don't know if I have a lot to say on it. 
But as the more you get into it, I, there's so much in, in your team. And one of the key things is culture, right? And when looking back, I think if you think about the culture of an organization and, and the different ones that, that I've built and cultivated, um, and they're all a little bit different and they're all critical, I, I think, into the, the successes and, and failures that I've had. Um, and I don't think, let me just define what I mean about culture and what I don't mean by culture. <laughs> is I, you know, I, culture sometimes gets confused. Nothing wrong with some of these cool things and perks, but it's not about wearing your pajamas to work or a wild party or a ping pong tournament um, or whatever crazy, you know, you've heard, well, all have heard it. We drive scooters around the, whatever. I mean, everyone's got their own little thing. And, I, and that's cool, right? That's fun and it's exciting. It creates a fun environment. And, you know, we've done the crazy things and, and, um, that's not what I'm talking about culture. That's fun, right? That could add to your culture, but I, culture is, I think, a little bit, at least from my definition, a little bit different than crazy perks. I think a successful culture, and it's, you don't really know if you have a good culture, a winning culture, a successful culture until you really go back and reflect, but I think it's really, it's really when there's kind of two different things I feel. It's like when you have the organization, again, I'm talking small companies, right? We're, we're talking a Fortune 500 company, I have zero experience in, I guess, it's probably a dramatically different culture than uh, what I'm making reference to. Um, but I think it's a situation when you have your company and you have your team and you feel you're at this stage that, um, that there's this belief from all the people, they really believe in what you're doing and every little step, everything you do and everyone is working cohesively moving forward, not to say there's good days, bad days, politics, whatever it might be, but you just feel like everyone is, is on board and engaged and, and moving forward in the single direction. Um, and it's amazing when you see that. And then what happens, and I, I don't mean literally their right arm when I say they're willing to give it, but it's, it's not when you, you're not asking someone to work extra hours, they're just doing it. And they're, they're just putting in all this extra time and thinking about it and working hard and adding so much in it, that intangible, if you think about it, if you can get this level of a culture, the intangible, the extra productivity and the extra bang for your buck that you get at this stage. Um, and it's really hard to create this. And I think it's, it's about hiring the right people. It's about um, the right idea. It's about the right um, formula of fun and serious. And I always take the work hard, play hard approach. Um, we work really hard and we play really hard. And you know, I think that, again, another cliche, but it's something that um, we use quite a bit. And the other thing I, I really realized is the influence on the co-founders of the CEO of the company and how amazing the impact. I, I didn't even realize um, uh, the impact on the culture that, um, that the, the co-founders of the CEO have um, when kind of setting up um, the company. And I, I felt it with one of my companies, I left before it was sold, um, Name Protect, and they brought in a new CEO, which I helped recruit, and it was someone dramatically different than me. And we had this really good team, it was really solid, um, and it, we, were, we had that, 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 that essence that I, I talked about before, about everyone working hard, and we brought in a new CEO, and it, I just saw the place deteriorate. And the people were no longer happy. They wanted to leave. And the team, over the next three or four or five or six months, were starting to leave. And new people were coming in. And it was all because it was just its the, the subtlest of things. And again, maybe it's obvious, right? I mean, you have someone that the CEO that's running the company. It's amazing how that tone is set from the, uh, the CEO across the org. Now I have a couple things that I live by and, and tips from, again, I hate the word tips, but things that have been successful for me. I don't like to build pyramids. Um, there's plenty of time when you're big and you need to get organized to build pyramids. I like everyone from a receptionist to the CEO. I don't think there's a lot of difference in a startup. I really don't. And um, you know, it's like uh, you know, like taking calls and customer service. I love taking calls. It's something that I'll just. I, I, it, it, and some days that I do. Um, and, and the customer service department, and I do it and I love it. And, you know, obviously I can't do it all the time, but I love doing all those different things. Or sitting at the front desk and, and spending two or three hours because someone, there's a, a, a break or someone needs someone or there's someone sick or something and helping out. It, it, it doesn't matter who you are in the org. It's a flat, this is your opportunity to not be worried about titles and pyramids. And when I mean by pyramids, the CEO has a group of people 
that you know that, that three or four people uh, report to the CEO and then three or four people report to them and all this structure and reporting and politics and I, I yeah I just avoid that as long as you possibly can because everyone's probably been in other orgs and and have seen enough of that and know that and <laughs> you'll get that and, and naturally pyramids form as you get bigger and the biggest company that I, well, the companies I've always had have sold before I've really right when I get to about a hundred employees. It seems I either fail or, or the company sells. So I have not really, so my personal goals, I'd really like to see if I have the skills to see if I can be in an organization that's bigger. I, I haven't done it. And maybe it's maybe I'm not the right person. Maybe my skill sets are just for these early days. Um, clearly, I'm not gonna put a slide up there to don't build pyramids when we have a you know 400 person company in front of, in front of a, a group of investors, probably wouldn't go right. Or even some of these other ones that I really passionately believe in. One is back into the early, I always, if you're an internet company, um, if you're an internet company, and I've, every one of mine have been internet companies, always hire a graphic designer. Do not outsource that. Um, it, because it's just one of those things. You're an internet company. Your, your, your uh, view to the world is through the internet, through the site. And, and, and to outsource that is, is just, it does not compute for me. And so it's funny that you know, we have co-founder, we have our team. One of the first people I'm looking for is a graphic designer right away. It's just amazing how, along with other people, but it's been really important to our success is to get someone, a, a graphic designer, um, and we pay a higher amount for that, uh, uh, maybe an unusually high, but to find the right person because it's so critical. And we outsource it. Think about it. All right, we want to build our website. Here's what we have. We're going to put together an RFP. We'll go send it out to a firm, and they're going to do it. All right, they built it. Good job. And then I guarantee tomorrow it's changing. And then you're right back out paying someone and doing it. It's inefficient, it's slow, you need that. There's a lot of other things you potentially could outsource. Um, as Becky, you said something, something that's so core to you, that would not be something you'd wanna outsource. Uh, definitely that one to me feels core if you're an internet startup. And the other one, this is <laughs> my personal pet peeve in an organization is I hate meetings. I don't believe in meetings. Now, there's, that means with an outside person, obviously you set up a meeting, when you wanna meet? Laura says, be here at four, I'm here at four, we talk, we do. So, right, no problem with meetings, but I, we do not have Outlook, we do not schedule meetings, we do not, I, I think, okay, so here's what happens, right, and, I, I, and I, I really firm this philosophy up coming from Microsoft, because at Microsoft, you literally, and maybe anywhere, but at Microsoft, it's amazing, it's like a school campus, in, in between the hour, the hallways are just packed with people buzzing around, and you look at someone's calendar, just block, 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 and it's every day, and oh yeah, six weeks from now, I got a little rectangle for you. And, um, and it's just, it's just, and then what happens is, and I've been in these, right? So you go into this and you go into a meeting and, and you have this meeting and maybe you get done what you want in 10 minutes. And then what do you do? You don't break the meeting. No, let's keep talking for another 50 minutes. <laughs> and then if you add that up over time and over time and over time, you're losing so many hours. It's amazing. You just are meeting because you're meeting because we had a meeting and we blocked it off. Well, let's talk. And it's not like you intentionally, like, oh, we're done. You just never get done with the meeting because you have it blocked. You just naturally, there's always someone that wants to talk. It'll just keep going. And so we just have a rule, and I've said it, we just, when you have something that's important, just meet. And meet, when it's done, get done with it. And it works. It's amazing how, now, again, when you're meeting with outside people or clients or partners, you can put meetings and it's you know, we're, we're punctual, we're on time, we, we, we're not, you know, crazies here, but, um, but when inside, if there's a problem or we need to meet on the, we meet, but it's just not scheduled. It's when, when something bubbles up where it's important enough to meet, meet. Otherwise, it's probably not important enough. And, and if you, you need this person, this, just get them. And, and again, it's not going to work at IBM. <laughs> but for a startup, it's amazing the efficiencies you get when you aren't structuring meetings. It, some people are really, and you know who you are, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, just for me, I hate meetings. And we just hired this person, and uh, it, it, he was uh, an executive. He's a, he came from a, a very a big agency, and a very formal agency, and his first day, he, doesn't know, he didn't know me other than the interview process. He goes, listen, all right, I got a meeting. I want to set up a meeting here. I want to set up a meeting here. I want to set up a meeting. This was his first day. I'm like, oh, you don't know. No one told you. Um, <laughs> And it was, uh, he doesn't do that anymore, but, um, <laughs> but he gets things done, no problem. Um, so those are my things on the, the CE, those are just my little things, but it's important in setting that culture, and you could be extremely successful 
having a meeting culture as well, um, and, 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 and these other things. I'm just, I guess my point is, is not to say follow this, but there are your things that you believe in that you have, and you know, it's really critical to stick to those and, and, and utilize those. Um, and then one more kind of crazy thing that, another one of my, I guess, philosophies, management philosophies, um, I hope I haven't lost any respect yet, but maybe after this one. Um, I believe that everyone exhibits um, temperament and traits of an animal. I mean, I mean animal, I mean any type of creature, right? And so I believe, you know, once I get to know you and I've worked with you, I just think that you exhibit situ just things like that are very similar to animals. And I thought I've been, I was working with people and, and then just something happened after a few years. I'm like, you remind me of this animal. And so I thought, why don't I just assign after I get to know you a little bit more and the company, and we ended up having an animal committee. We didn't meet, <laughs> um, but we had a committee um, and we needed to meet, we met. But anyway, I would assign everyone an animal. And so, and again, are you thinking, okay, well, you come in, you, you work at uh, maybe Hopster, you wanna come work there and you're gonna be an, well, I wanna be a, you know, you don't set your, your animal. Like I'd love to be a bald eagle or a lion or something, but you don't get to set your, your, your animal. And so we've had a number of animals throughout the, and I had to have mine set by the employees and I set with a few other help of other people, but there's this amazing. So like, so um, just to give you an example of how powerful this, like, okay, my co-founder for Hopster, he is a gazelle. And let me tell you what I mean. He is, he's very, uh, he's a very slick tongue. He's sleek. He's, uh, uh, he's, he, he can really maneuver around an audience. He's a guy that can work in a, in a, in a room and, and, and talk to you. But whenever there's some anger or something's getting a, a little edgy, there's some controversy, boom, he's just gone. <laughs> and so I thought, this guy is like a gazelle. I mean, he's a, he's a sleek animal, and, and so he gets a gazelle. And so um, and, and I could go on and on and on. I mean, we've had, we've had cows. We've had armadillos, we've had squirrels, we've had, and so, I mean, what's my animal? <laughs> um, they gave me um, uh, uh, this thing. Um, and, uh, and I'm like, why? Why did you guys give me that? And I, I don't necessarily agree with it, but again, you can't pick your animal. <laughs> Apparently, I mean, so these things are, if you ever been around, uh, and I always think of it as the Fruit Loop thing, <laughs> right? So, yeah, toucan, thank you, a toucan is my animal. And, you know, you always know if you're in the woods and you see a toucan, you always know a toucan's there. Arr, arr, you're making a lot of noise. And so I'm always taught, you're in, I'm in the room, you're gonna know I'm in the room generally. And they're very colorful, they make themselves known. And they're kind of bouncing around from, anyway, that's what they said. So I'm a toucan, I don't really like it, but you live with it. Um, and, and, but so I won't go through all of them, but the, it's amazing how like um, our VP of sales is actually a crab. And it's weird for me, he's a very atypical VP of sales. I'll end with this one, but he, he's in his room and, and, in his office and he's, he, he's, he kind of burrows, right? He closes his door, he kind of tucks in. He's very athletic and a crab can lift like three times their weight or whatever. And, uh, and uh, he's got a nice little bite, but you, he's kind of quiet and he burrows and he hunkers in his room. So he's a crab. So everyone's got a little bit, it's not about looks, right? I mean, that would be all, I'm not trying to, well, you look like, uh, no, it's, it's about temperament and personality. That would just never fly. Like an example of our, we had a cow, right? So who wants to be the cow? Well, it was our accountant, right? And our, 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 uh, um, our controller. And a cow, think about what a cow is. A cow provides, right? They provide milk, they provide meat. They're, they're, they're kind of just lumber. They don't make a lot of noise. They don't really, enter, and so this person is a cow. And um, it provides for the company. Anyway, so you'd think, okay, so I know what you're thinking, right? So, oh my God, if he could put me as an animal and I didn't like, I would quit there in two seconds. What happened, and amazingly, is it became such a part of our culture, people, it would take a few weeks to get your animal. People would be like on me, Brian, what's my animal? What's my animal? And I just did it as fun, right? And I was like, okay, you kind of have a temperament or a personality like that. And it took over, not enforced by me, but the employees took it over and, and then it turned out you'd have an unveiling ceremony and when you get your animal and, um, and, and but then, then people started to put it as their, their icon on their, you know, whatever it might be. They put it in, they, all of a sudden I give them their animal and the next thing you know, their office or desk is decorated in that animal, uh, even the cow. Um, and, um, and so 
it was they just took it on it was part of the culture it was really and then and they just didn't feel part of the team until they got their animal my point is i'm not again these are not don't go back and do this it just works for us and it's part of our culture it's something that i set it works and it's amazing the team camaraderie you get out of it and the culture and the the, the belonging and the sense of of doing and accomplishing and, it, and that that is unbelievably intangible and so I have one more thing. I don't know what time it is, but um, pretty close. Um, the, the, uh, is the, the, so obviously you want to be happy. <laughs> if you're not happy with your animal, I guess that'd be a problem. But um, I have one more little thing that I think is um, something I do and I ask employees to do every single day. And I do it myself too. I think it's really critical. It's, and I think everyone could do it right now. And <laughs> I think it's critical when you talk about team. And that's what this session's about. It's team, team, team is I, I ask everyone in the company every single day when you're driving to work or taking the bus or whatever it might be, walking or whatever it is, take the driving to work test. I do, if you know me, why I'll be driving. Is, I'm, am I excited to go to work today? And ask that question. <laughs> it's amazing. And I said, if, you, if, if the answer is ever no, immediately create a meeting with me right now. <laughs> um, you know, come right in and talk to me. Let's, get a, let's just figure out what that is. And, if you, and it's amazing. When I said that, it sounds like one of these you know, animal things, name everyone an animal, kind of dumb things that you do to create a company. Um, but it actually is amazing the power of it, right? You could do it yourself wherever you're working, whatever you're doing. Every day when you're driving to work, if you answer that question and you say, am I excited to go to work today? And if you answer no, I would really suggest that you do something about that right now. The date, the, the time, the time that it switches from yes to no. Obviously, remove out, you know, <laughs> the bumps of bad days and good days, but I'm talking in general, if you're really not excited, change it that day. And it's been amazing the results that I've had with this. And so I ask everyone to do it. Every kind of staff function that we have or anything, I always say, make sure you do that. And, and I tell new people that we bring on, this is you know, really important. And a lot of people have come in and have told me things. Hey, I just am not excited today to come to work. And so instead of, think about this, I'll just tell one little quick story. Instead of um, someone that's not happy they don't like it, whatever reason, uh, 10 billion reasons it could be, they go off and they're on their own, they're coming to work ha unhappy every day, and maybe they're looking for another job, they're spending cycles, they're not part of that culture, that cohesive culture I just talked about, right? I don't know anything, no one knows about this, they're coming to work unhappy, they're looking for another job, and all of a sudden, bam, they come in and give two weeks. Think, and, and they're, they're gone. Now think about that unproductivity and all of that time and energy that wasn't moving towards your goal as a startup. That employee was not not a very good functioning part of the team, and so instead of letting that happen, and, and, and you know, think about it, a two-week notice might be hard to react to that. You got to hire; it's a distraction. It's a, it's it's really disruptive to a company. And so, I, what happened magically by doing this driving to work test is people, when they'd start to have that feeling, would start to come in and say, "I'm not happy," and most of the time, we fix it and take care of whatever the situation is. But in many cases, not many cases, some cases, it just didn't work out. And so instead of giving a two-week notice and all that disruption and all that was great, I helped the person find, I mean, we, we were, they're good enough to, to be part of the team. And so we helped the person find another job, was part of the process, and it was easier to get time off to interview. And, and think about it from the company, it was so much easier that we knew this person was wanting to leave, we could plan, we could find another person. It was, and I'd love to one of these days, um, really quantify two things, no meetings and, and getting an unhappy employee taken care of right away to quantify what that can mean to productivity of a team. And I feel it's amazing, especially for a small team, and um, of, of, of getting some of those things out there. So that's kind of my last thought. I wanted to leave with uh, um, a happy employee is essential uh, employee. And if you have happy employees, you're going to have a great team. And I think if you have a great team, you will find or you'll be on your path to great success. Questions? Great talk, thank you. What's, what kind of rules do you use for early stage compensation? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, and I didn't get into a lot, a lot of those types of things, and there are a ton of stuff, is I, I view, and, and I think it's a standard thing, and um, that equity is a big part of, of a startup's compensation. I, and I've gotten arguments with a lot of members of our team about, you know, some people like, let's just give the key people options. Let's, you know, let's just use a receptionist, for example, is I feel that person should receive options as well. And so I think everyone across the org, at least until you get to some stage where it, maybe it changes and, and there's some difference. So one is options, I think, is really critical. And I'm always not stingy there. And I can tell you that, uh, that there's several people that uh, became millionaires from option plans that we've given on companies that I've started. And it's really exciting to see that. Um, it, where someone becomes a millionaire from just getting an over average day salary and they get that. So options are critical. A lot of people, when you get options, they don't really realize or value it. So that you have to, I think, really work hard when you're giving compensation to make sure that they value it. Um, and um, so I think that's a big part of it. So my rule is always pay fair, market wage. You may be on, you know, I don't, I don't, you don't want to underpay someone. You know, some people could say, well, underpay and make it up with options. But I think, you know, pay someone fairly and give a, a really good um, option plan. Uh, and I, fairly, I'd say we're probably on the low end of, you know, you know, if you went and did a study and this, and you know, a VP of sales makes this and that and the other, we're probably on the low end of the national averages or maybe the averages for this region. But the options, I think, are overly generous. And I, and I really work hard to make sure they understand the value of that and because a lot of people don't. Um, and then bonuses, if we get to bonuses, I, I never do bonuses, really cash bonuses until you're profitable. Startups aren't usually profitable. So I generally always, if there is going to be, a, it's funny, I sometimes do a test and, and say, well, you can have options or you can have cash. What would you take? And it's kind of a trap <laughs> when I ask the question because it really tells me a little bit about, there's also what you might need cash as well. So, but I, I generally like to do that as well, is offer options as well. And I really think sharing, and, and one of the special things for me is seeing, um, <laughs> excuse me, that excitement when everyone you know, wins when the company sells. I think that's a really powerful moment. So options are a big thing. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, about bringing people in from other environments that might be more structured into the sort of the wide open startup. And I've had concerns about that just from the perspective of, you know, people that have been in that environment for 10, 12, 15 years, are they gonna adapt and adjust? And I think, you know, I mean, it is. It's, it's shifting sands, it's different pivot points in the startup, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about people adjusting and adapting to that environment, even though you know, they might have the, the technical skills, I don't know if they have the resiliency to go for that ride. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and, and you know, if you had a choice of bringing someone that had um, experience in, in internet companies or startup companies versus someone that's from another environment, I think I clearly, I totally agree with you. I think it definitely gets you off going. They can be more productive early. Um, I didn't have the, you know, the luxury. One of the things and I didn't talk about, I was thinking about putting in here is about kind of recruiting in, in the Midwest here and different skills that you can recruit in the Midwest and that you can get right here in Madison and different skills that you can't. But when I was first starting the first few businesses in 96 and, and you said you're an internet company, I just remember I, I had my house at the time, just a quick aside to that kind of point you're saying is I was out on my deck and I always hated getting out on my deck. I sold the first business and I was out in the back of the deck and this neighbor moved in across the way and there was kind of a tighter subdivision and this guy on the deck was facing our deck and, and um, hey, you're one of those internet guys. And I'm like, oh my God, it's my home. I just wanted to tuck in and hide. But you were kind of, that was very strange to find you know talent that was, um, it's someone that had internet or startup skills back then. And so, but now it's getting easier and better. And so you don't always have to bring someone that other environment. I totally agree. And I think to that point also, I think you have to uh, come with something else intangible besides just taking someone that has really good skills that worked at this large company. I think there maybe has to be a little something that you're sure about um, because it is difficult because they could flounder, right? I mean, I've, I, I've had a number of scenarios where it just doesn't work to your point. But it is, a, I, I do have to say, it is a really, it's one of my favorite things is day one of someone that came, comes from an environment and, 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 uh, and just letting them kind of you know, adjust to the animal kingdom here. And, uh, but it, it is, it is kind of uh, challenging, I totally agree. Uh, I see a lot of similarities in um, the 
building the culture between the founder and the CEO. Have you, um, I know you are the founder of many companies and you, it says up there you were the CEO. Um, what, I mean, I guess what differences, is there a breaking point between building that culture I, in the one in the company you are now, I see you are the CEO, so, I mean, in that yeah, transition. I mean, to go to that, I mean, I think that's really, because so, again, just because my situation worked out this way, let's go with the situation where you are a scientist or you are someone extremely technical and then you are the founder, you have your idea, um, and you know, a lot of, with Wharf, right, that's a lot of the, the, the circumstances that uh, where you have a technology and the, the, the inventor of that technology um, may not be that CEO. And so when you have that situation, you immediately, I think it makes everything that I said even almost more paramount because of the channel, because now you have someone that has the idea. Now you need to find someone, bring someone in that didn't create it. And you immediately, there's just a difference. Now you can get there and you can find the right person, but there's something, it, it, it's just kind of the difference between having your own child and adopting maybe. I, I used to try to find an analogy. There's just something a little bit different, but you can get there. Um, and I think it's about hiring that, that CEO and ad having that adapt with, I mean, hiring that CEO and adapting with that founder. And that's one of the big challenges. And I see it in a ton and ton of like a, um, a, some of the, the angel funds and, and they might be focusing on that. And one of the things there's just a, a, it's one of the things that I would recommend not moving forward until you have that formula down because you're just wasting time and money until that magic connected is working. You have to have that that culture established and feel that comfort that you know now the CEO is working with that founder and they're moving forward because it is a big challenge. I, I personally, I've always been the CEO and the founder um, and so I don't have that, but I, I see it in a lot of companies. One more, sure. You mentioned earlier that one of the advantages of influencing the influencers was that um, you, you've never had to try to hire new employees with uh, job postings. You just had a network that, so who exactly is giving and receiving those jobs? So uh, let, me, let me correct that. I, I, I've hired a number of people through job boards and, and, and uh, that. So but some of the key positions that I think if I, of, of, if I go back to all five of my companies, I don't think I've ever hired a VP through a job board or through a, some sort of uh, job service. It, um, I've, I've tried recruiters, I've not been successful, but I think that'd be one route clearly to go. Um, but I've always used the network, right? So uh, just an example, I'll go back to Paul Richa from Foley, right? If I have, a, all right, I have a, a VP of sales that I need or I need a board member. And so I say, well, I'll just go, I go to the, the members of my advisory team, the, the accountants, the attorneys, investors, advisors and I go I need a this position um, and do you know anyone and remarkably you know like a, a nice thing about the, the of getting a um, someone like and again I'm not trying to plug Foley here I mean I actually I like Paul at Foley um, but the uh, is that they have a nice network of big offices all around the country they can really um, really get that wide net and cast it so um, I think that you can really utilize those types of networks. But again, I'm not to say that you wouldn't necessarily go those other routes. I've been successful with that, and I think it's one of the advantages of those team members. Not a end-all, be-all. I, I think you're gonna need a diverse set of tools to get there. Thank you.